Okay, I think this is time to start. So welcome everybody to this non-strive uh, learning lab. The title is Eight Common Pitfalls of Social Norms Intervention, Theory in Assistance of Better Practice, and it's presented by Ben Chislagi. I'm Martin Colombian. I'm also uh, working, I'm working on the Strive um, collaboration. I'm assisting with the Indian, our Indian collaborators, both in um, Karnataka and in Mumbai. So KHPT in Karnataka, I'm, I'm, I'm um, helping on the qualitative research component there of the two trials, Samatha and Samvedana Plus. And um, I'm also assisting on the analysis of the Parivartan uh, intervention in Mumbai. So for those new to STRIVE, STRIVE is a research consortium funded by DFID to tackle the structural drivers of HIV. The consortium partners in India, Tanzania, uh, South Africa, US, and the UK are conducting research into a range of structural factors, including alcohol, transactional sex, gender norms, stigma, and violence. So today, Ben Chislagi will uh, presents eight pitfalls that practitioners must avoid as they plan to integrate a social norms perspective in their interventions, as well as eight learnings. The presentation will be followed by questions and discussions. So Ben will talk for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, so, you know, if anything comes up, feel free to type questions into the chat box as you think of them, and we will pick them up at the end then. So we will have about half an hour presentations and then half an hour, a little bit less for discussion. So Ben, here you go. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Martine. So, well, thank you everyone for connecting. Let's see if I can, yes, great. Um, so this presentation is report on a, a paper that came out on um, globalization and health that I wrote together with Lori Heisey. Um, it's a presentation that is part of a larger work. Um, and I realized when I sent this PowerPoint, I only realized afterwards that animations do not translate into this system. So I'm sorry, there is a bit of um, text here that you might not be fully seeing. But, but the, idea, the idea of this work is to be part of an effort to translate uh, theory into learnings for practice. So in a way, I usually start this presentation by, by using this cappuccino metaphor. Um, undisclosedly, obviously, because I'm Italian, and so it is a national drink. But the idea here is that, in a way, in the theory, you have a lot of stuff that I compare to the milk foam in the cappuccino that is great and allows you to, um, to engage with a certain problem in ways that, that offer profound and virtuous insights, but then that maybe have little relevance for the practice. So stuff exists in the theory, often, uh, that, are the, uh, that, that, that doesn't affect much, maybe on, would only affect a very, very small percentage, percentage of what's done in the field in the practice. So, so to me, what matters in a theory, what really matters is the juice that is worth the squeeze or, or the espresso. So in other words, what I will be doing in the next 20 minutes, about 20 minutes, is try to get down to what is helpful in social norms theory for better practice uh, that tries to facilitate change in harmful behavior and practices. And those of you who are already knowledgeable of social norms theory might think that I am skimming through or um, being um, 
the, the being theoretical promiscuous uh, or spurious. Uh, and that is because I try to focus on the learnings that I think are key as we translate, so as we try to use social norms theory for better practice. So this is kind of a caveat. Um, and I guess the, the fascination with social norms theory really comes out of the realization that occurred in a, a different, um, during different decades in different um, spaces or uh, in health, in global health work. That occurred, uh, so the, the realization that new knowledge, setting material resources aside, that new knowledge doesn't of always, and if anything, only rarely, results in new practices. Um, so if you take, for instance, the, um, if, you have, if you have read uh, Poor Economics by, um, by uh, Dufra and her colleague, Bhattaji, you will remember that even the people who were given food vouchers to buy more, to buy any food they liked, but they, um, they used those vouchers to buy uh, comfort food rather than more nutritious food, even though they knew that more nutrition food would help them reduce malnutrition. Um, or another example that I often refer to is um, comes from the work done by one of my colleagues uh, at the Gates Foundation, who at the time was working in India. And that's a very, it's a fascinating story to me. So what he was doing, uh, he was working on um, lead prevention interventions. So they were trying to prevent people to, to, to drink unsafe water. And to do so, they were painting all the unsafe pipes in red and all the safe pipes in green. Um, and then one day he's doing these qualitative interviews. He goes to the house of, of, of a village chief and and he asks them, "Do you know? Do you know about? Do you know about what lead poisoning is? Do you know why it's dangerous?" And and this man knew everything that what, that he needed to know about the um, uh, about the risk of death that would uh, follow drinking from unsafe pipes. So then this colleague of mine was about to leave and, and decided to ask a last question. And, and he asked him, so where do you drink from? And this village chief pointed to a red pipe, so an unsafe pipe. And when asked why, the village chief said, well, yes, I know, I do know that uh, this pipe is, uh, is, is, is unsafe for me. And I also would be happy I would rather not get lead poisoning, obviously, but I cannot go and send my wife into my neighbor's house because women are not allowed, it's considered shameful, it's considered a loss of honor if a woman alone goes into the house of another man that is not related to her. So in other words, knowledge and attitudes can sometimes not... Um, not result in new practices because of the way in which people construct the reality together or the mutual expectation or as we as many people refer to uh, now or because of social norms so so social norms theory is extremely complex well it's extremely multifaceted uh, and there are different theories and um, some of these are uh, contrasting uh, and this is because the social norms construct is really uh, as old as the history of philosophy itself, if not even older. Uh, you find reference to it in Aristotle, and then later in um, Grotius, St. Thomas, um, uh, Hume, uh, um, Immanuel Kant, and, and so on and so forth. So, so in a way, when it needs to be reduced down to one concept, I would say that social norms are really regulate, are, unwritten rules of behavior that regulate what behavior is considered or what actions are considered normal. So in this example, you have this chicken um, who is trying to look, act like a flamingo, uh, be considered a flamingo. Um, and, and among these many theories, the ones that has been used the most in public health and, and global health, and I see that uh, 
Uh, Bob Unger is, is on the line and his work with Val Curtis has been very informative and helped, helped us a lot in, um, in understanding how social norms dynamic affect people's behavior. Well, so the much work that is being done currently on social norms it builds off the theory that social norms are people's beliefs. So exactly as people have beliefs about the world, factual belief, if you'd like, for instance, that um, when it rains, if I get out under the rain, I'll get wet. People also have social beliefs, beliefs about other people. And two particular types of these social beliefs have been studied as social norms. And these two beliefs are one, what a one person believes that others around do. And two, what one person believes others around them approve and disapprove of. So uh, the classic example, and, and the classic example is handshaking. So if I'm going to a job interviews, my belief is that the person who's interview, interviewing me will, will offer their hand uh, and that if I don't shake that hand, I will be disapproved for it. Um, so, so if that is the main point, then some implications exist for practice that need to be taken into account by practitioners. The first implication is that or the first pitfall, if you'd like, is that social norms and personal attitudes are different constructs. Um, and very often they get conflated. And one of the reasons they get, they, they get conflated is because in different theories of social norms, um, norms have been studied particularly in how they shape personal attitudes. While in a lot of work done in global health, Work is being done in understanding, efforts have, have, has been put in understanding how norms and attitudes diverged and, and what were the implications for the practice. So what does it mean that norms and attitudes diverge? Well, here's, here's a story I often tell. Uh, it's the story of a little girl um, and it's, it's her um, uncle's wedding. Uh, so so when, when her father walks her, uh, calls her down the stairs, uh, after she's been asked to get ready for, for the wedding, she comes down dressed like a singer of the, of the KISS group. So more similar to a, a young vampire than a wedding, um, than a wedding participant, a, a wedding guest. So the father doesn't have any problem with her getting dressed like that. But then he thinks about what the granddad will say or what the rest of the family will say. And so sends her back up to be dressed uh, appropriately. So, so the, the importance of understanding the difference between attitudes, what this little girl wanted to do, and the norm, what this girl ended up doing, has relevance when we study norms in the ground because people might, for, both for measurement and for uh, practice purposes, people might not be doing what they want, but they're doing what they think is approved. So here are some norms that we found in our me or, or others of my colleagues found in their work um, in the last few years. So here's, this, is, this, is a, this is a classic example that comes from femogenic study, research done in female genital cutting in West Africa, in, in, in communities where parents who didn't want to cut their daughter, or if you like, who didn't want to practice female genital mutilation cutting to their daughter, did so because doing so increased the likelihood that she will find a good husband. Uh, here's another example from, um, this is in UK schools. I wouldn't like to smoke. I don't like smoking. My first cigarette, I hated my first cigarette. But you know, I have to do it to look cool, to be part of the member, the, the, to be part of the gang. Uh, this, is, this is a very common uh, example that is done and is used in uh, from using a lot of data from U.S. Uh, campuses, university campuses. I wouldn't like to drink that much, but you have to fit in, so I do. Uh, this is a personal example from my from from my experience. I gave to my nephew a helmet to protect him. But he said, uh, "Uncle, I can't wear this helmet. I like it. I would love to, but, but you know, it's just for the geeks, and so on and so forth." The, the next one is an example from Western Uganda. Um, where we found that children wouldn't want to uh, be seen defending 
uh, another child who was being bullied because they didn't want to be associated with them, even though they felt that was unfair. And this final is an example from my own, um, actually from my own um, ethnographic work a few years back now, about 10 years ago. Uh, when I was sitting in, in this, in this, at the time, uh, it took me quite a bit of time to understand the dynamic of what was happening, but I was sitting in, in the courtyard of a village chief and uh, the, the youngest daughter of the village chief goes in the middle of the courtyard, takes down her trousers, and she does what she needs to do. Mm. So she pulls in the middle of the courtyard. And the mother who's sitting next to me doesn't really care. Well, she knows I'm a foreigner, so all my habits are very weird anyway, so she doesn't care about me. And the daughter, she's probably just thinking, well, I'll have to clean that up later. But a minute after, through the, the courtyard, through the fence, here you see her mother-in-law walking through. And at that very minute, I remember very clearly, this woman who's next to me, the mother of the, of the girl, she looks at her mother-in-law, she stands up, she goes to her daughter, and she slaps her. And then when I asked her later on, she told me, well, you know, I, don't, I didn't really care, but... But if I don't slap her, then my mother-in-law will say, well, you're not re a very good mother. Um, you will, uh, you will grow, you're growing my son's children in the worst way possible. So this is, this is just an example of how norms can affect um, behaviors and can affect uh, harmful practices. Or, uh, and, and, and I can cite many more if you'd like to. So the value of distinguishing between the two. Uh, the second pitfall that I'd like to cite that we mentioned in this paper is that a lot of research historically emerging from the alcohol prevention work in U.S. campuses has gone into understanding uh, norms in their misalignment with attitudes. So what, what I mean by that is that a lot of research has started from the assumption that work on social norm is worth, is worth doing only when people have a protective attitude, as in the example I, I made, I wouldn't want to hit this child, but the norm is harmful. So I wouldn't want to hit this child, but but I need to do so um, because that's what people that's what because otherwise my mother-in-law would come after me. So so there are two biases in in in, in this in this um, assumption. The first one, the first bias is that uh, that is always the case. Obviously. Uh, norms and attitudes can be aligned. So I might be hitting the child, this child, not only because I know that that's what my family members would approve of greatly, but also because I think that's the only way my child will learn. So in terms of practice, if that is true, well, then I have to change both the attitude and the norm um, if I am in the second condition. While instead, when I'm in this first condition, the norm and the attitude are um, discordant, well then one, as we, will, as, as we mentioned later on, one effective intervention has been just showing that actually it, that, that most people are, have a protective attitude, so essentially correcting the misperception. So the second assumption that is unhelpful in thinking uh, about norms work as being necessarily uh, embedded in, 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 a, in a system where the norms are harmful and the, and the attitude is protective um, relates to um, relates to the to the next pitfall, which is about overlooking protective norms. So a lot of work is being done on harmful norms, and very little in research and practice is done at, at the time of format of the intervention design to understand the protective norms that are in place and then might actually we might uh, leverage as we're trying to um, help people improve uh, and, and, and change their harmful practices into, into helpful or protective ones. Um, this, is, this is frequently or more and more increasingly uh, mentioned, particularly in those research and intervention design partnerships between academic and, and practitioners. Uh, but I think this is a, still a piece on which we can do more work. Um, then the next pitfall that, that is also related to, um, to the importance of understanding both harmful practice and protective practice, sorry, harmful norms and protective norms, is that these norms intersect with uh, a system of material, 
institutional, individual, and social drivers. So here's the assumption is that norms are the sole driver of harmful practices. And while this might be true in certain cases, and particularly, particularly in this case where norms and attitudes are discordant, um, it's very rare, it's, it's, it's almost unique for a, a harmful behavior to be sustained exclusively by a harmful practice. So this, this, this framework that you see on the left side of the slide that we, we uh, frequently refer to as the flower framework essentially is, uh, is, a, is an evolution, if you like, of the ecological framework where the domains of influence overlap um, so that they offer play spaces where potential factors, as for instance, institutional factors, say for instance, attitudes, and so, sorry, individual factors, as for instance, attitudes, and institutional ones, say for instance, the law, overlap uh, in ways that affect, interact, uh, affect, affect practices in their interactions. So here's an example of what this means. Take for instance, that you are working on, on domestic violence or intimate part of violence, and, and uh, you are looking at how institutional factors are helping uh, reducing the prevalence of IPV, intimate partner violence, and you see that there is a law that has made IPV legal, well, it's important then to understand how that law intersects with, for instance, police officers' attitudes. So if police officers hold attitudes um, sustaining the idea that it's a woman's place to be beat, uh, to be hit, uh, to be hit, and um, to to suffer her, whatever, to do whatever her husband wants, then the institutional factor alone uh, won't be enough to um, to achieve change in the practice. So these spaces of overlap, we suggest, are the spaces where norms are the most the most active. Um, so this internal flower is what we call uh, the normative space. Then the fifth uh, pitfall to which I would like to refer to today, out of eight, is that sometimes the, the, the current fascination with the social norms, with social norms theory, um, is, has sometimes led to the conclusion that uh, prevalence of a norm um, means that the norm has a lot of influence. So what is the difference between the prevalence of a norm and its influence? Well, let me give you an example from a from um, from from this study that essentially look at, at how much uh, urine was found in swimming pools. So in American swimming pools, 20 gallons of urine were on average found in in any in, in a random sample of, swim, of swimming pools in the U.S. So what this tells us is essentially that a lot of people, a large percentage of the swimmers in the swimming pools that were uh, part of this study. Uh, urinate in the swimming pool. At the same time, a concurrent study came out um, published by the, um, the Department of Health um, uh, of the United States government that found that a lot of people found it unacceptable. Uh, they were, sorry, a lot of people were ashamed of, um, or found it unacceptable to, to pee in a swimming pool. So, swim, so swimming pool administrations cannot put in the, in the water a urine detector because that's bad for your skin. And, but they can put, but what, so you can't buy a urine detector, but what you can buy is a sign that says that the urine, the urine detector has been added to the water, even though that's false. So the, the attempt that is trying, the, the, the swimming pool management are trying to, to do by installing um, the signs is to increase the beliefs that if I urinate in the swimming pool, I'll be, I'll be found out, I'll be detected. So in other words, even though I have the belief that that is not acceptable, since the practice urinating in the swimming pool is almost hidden because nobody has a way of knowing that I've just urinated in the swimming pool, even though I have a strong normative belief that I'm not supposed to do that, if I believe that nobody's going to find out, I'll do it anyway. Um, in other words, and we, we argued this in, in greater detail uh, in this paper that is published with Health Psychology. But what this really boils down to is that certain characteristics of the practice can influence the strength of a norm to the point, and I'll give you an example from child marriage in a minute, in a second. So to the point that 
norms might make a certain practice obligatory to the extent that I really have no choice but to comply, or they might make them appropriate. So I could get away without doing it, but there is a great advantage for me to comply with the norm. Um, an example is an, an adolescent who wants to be accepted in a group, um, and, and um, if she doesn't smoke, the, the other in the group will not come after her saying, you really need to smoke because, I, because, because that's part of what we do. They, they won't care, but it's better for this one adolescent, this one adolescent judge is better for her to smoke in the group. Or a, a weaker state, norms um, make something possible or to make something acceptable or tolerated. An example is uh, a man who believes that he can harass a woman in the street because nobody will intervene. And at their weakest, norms make just something possible. This is the work that is coming out, for instance, of the diffusion of innovation kind of work. So the belief that everyone is using a new rise in their fields uh, makes it possible for me. So if everyone uses that rise, that might be actually good. So I'm not trying to achieve any group membership. I'm not trying to get positive social rewards for complying with the norm. But, but the descriptive norm, the belief that everyone else does something, uh, makes it possible for me, opens up the, almost opens up the, opens up a, the, the behavior as a cognitive possibility. So here's the example I mentioned from child marriage. This is a study that we did in 2017 together with the University of California, San Diego, uh, with my colleagues Holly Shakya and Jerry Mackey. And so we did a qualitative study in four different, uh, across four different ethnic groups. The study was justified by the fact that while child marriage was uh, decreasing in the north, it was increasing in the southeast. And we, we were not quite sure what was going on. Uh, and I can tell you later about this study if you like. But one of the things that we found is that even though the norm that respectable women marry early after puberty, even though that norm existed in three of, actually in four of the, uh, the ethnic groups where we conducted that research, its strength varied. So if you look at the first ethnic group, the Maka, they told us, yes, it's possible, it happens, but it's uncommon. So, and, and this person, this participant said, it's marriage or race. Marriage comes at its time. We don't force it. One day you should get married. Um, but then the MAFA, the second group, they were a little bit more, um, they described the norm that was slightly stronger. So this participant said, yeah, well, now that she's 22, she can still find a husband. It's not impossible for her, but, but that's not really convenient to her. You know, she won't find the husband of her dreams. So in a way, they told us that um, in, in, their, in their context, child marriage was appropriate. And then the Moro and the Muslim instead gave us, uh, uh, told us that the, the norm of marriage was much stronger. The, the first participant said, to me, it would be very difficult for her to get married. At the age, all her sister would be in their marital homes. And this Muslim participant said, it would be difficult for her to find a husband now that she's 22, because she's stigmatized by the people in the the other, the, the second last pitfall that I have for this presentation is that, say, um, actually the third last, is that very often we tend to focus on direct, what we call direct influence of social norms. And, and this really, an, exa an example I have comes out of the work done on female genital cutting. Um, in places where um, Maki, Bikieri, uh, Shel Duncan and others in West Africa have, have found that the norm um, the, the, sorry, the practice of female genital cutting was sustained by the norm. Well, the normative belief was exactly that I should comply with female genital cutting. So in other words, the behavior or the practice female genital cutting, that is also known as female genital mutilation, was sustained by a norm of female genital mutilation. Or again, in other words, parents were cutting their daughter because they believed that others around them approve of them cutting their daughter. But that is not the only way in which norms can influence behavior. So while that, this, direct, um, this direct case uh, is, 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 is being widely studied, for instance, the work done on alcohol and in US campuses is another example where students drank a lot because they believed that was uh, what was approved of them. Norms also interact in systems and bundles. Uh, and here's an example of what this means. So take, for instance, 
the behavioral practice of intimate partner violence or domestic violence, a man hitting his wife in, in the example I'm giving. So this man is hitting his wife, not because he believes that this, this way his friends would approve of. So it's not the case that this man absolutely wouldn't want to hit his wife, but the norm is just so strong that there is a corresponding norm uh, telling him that absolutely he needs to hit his wife to be accepted in the group, for instance. Rather, there are norms that are facilitating or making it possible or sus contributing in sustaining the practice. And here are three examples. A norm of family honor. So you're not supposed to talk to others about what's happening in the family, which means that the wife will not ref go, go to the police or, or to the social services um, to report the case. A norm of family privacy, which means that the neighbors will, will not intervene in the act of violence, even, even though they overhear it, because that's not what's done. Or a norm of tolerance of violence, by which the wife might think that if she goes and tells her friends that she's being beaten, her friends will tell her, will tell her well, what do you expect? That's what, we, that's what women need to tolerate to keep the family together, so suck it up and maybe ostracize her. The second last pitfall that I have in this presentation that, that relates um, particularly to, um, to some work, again, done by Chardini and others, uh, who, found, so, who are the, the people who um, uh, minted the term descriptive norm and injunctive norms, is the finding that relates to the finding that uh, public, publicizing the wide prevalence of a harmful practice might potentially result in more people complying with it. So if people tend to do, so, so, if what others, so, so if beliefs about what people do influence what one person does, well, presenting to this one person evidence that everyone around you is doing the harmful practice might increase the likelihood of this person engaging the harmful practice. Now, if you ask me, I don't think that someone who's solidly convinced that he or she will never commit rape will be pushed to rape by the normative belief. But I'm not so sure that people who are on the edge, who think that they are entitled, who maybe feel, feel emasculine, emasculated by the, the society, who feel powerless and need to reassert their power and might be tempted to commit rape, my see in the my find in the belief that everyone is doing it a facilitator to them also ending up becoming a perpetrator of rape. So then the last pitfall uh, that I that we included in this paper really relates to the process, the ethical and effective processes through which social 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 norms change uh, can be facilitated by practitioners. So this slide really refers to. The idea, so as you can see, this is a, um, a comic by Tom Gold, and who has a lot of very insightful comics, and uh, his work is on the internet. is absolutely brilliant. So there is this, this human who is really scared, and the robot says, "Don't worry, I'll save you." And then the human says, "This isn't really not quite what I had in mind." So in a way, what this speaks to is the the, the foregone assumption that can sometimes exist in social norms interventions that actually the true assumptions, the first one being that we can only, we, that changing one norm will leave everything else together, will leave everything else as it is, will leave the social fabric as it is, um, and everything will keep going on with just one change in the in the relations that, 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 that the people that, work, that live in the context where we're working have. Um, this is illusionary and, and calls for a deep understanding of the context when we start to work on social norms work. So if, for instance, we change uh, a norm, the norms sustaining child marriage, eventually resulting in the practice of child marriage, this will have wider implications that we need to be capable of at the very latest uh, envision or anticipate. And then the second more profound and, and problematic implication of, of this pitfall is on who should lead the social norms change uh, intervention or, 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 or process. In other words, where the, does the mandate for international institutions to social engineer the cultural and social context in which people live and thrive comes from? And my response, uh, which is also in this book, but my response about, and, and in this paper I'm reviewing, uh, 
um, my response of this conundrum is to that social norms change interventions should be faci should facilitate people led um, transformation of existing social norms that uh, are an obstacle to their collective well-being and development. And, and so that these interventions should be um, facilitate dialectic conver and iterative conversations about what people value and how the existing harmful practices are an obstacle to people's values and then on why people are conforming with those practices so the social norms are now perceived by the people themselves as an obstacle to achieving um, their collective well-being. So this is, really, this is really what I wanted to present to you today. This is the summary of this paper that uh, is on globalization and health, and, and you can uh, read and, and, and then I'm, I'm welcoming to, I'm wel we're, we're now be welcoming all the questions, but you can always be, uh, reach out to me after this presentation and my email is on the bottom of this slide. Thank you very much, Ben. And my apologies to you and to our uh, participants for totally co uh, forgetting to uh, introduce you at the start of the call. <laughs> so <laughs> as you've noticed, <laughs> as you've witnessed, he, Ben is very well placed for presenting this learning lab. He is the assistant professor here um, in social norms um, in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and uh, he's an avid reader and he's built that theoretical knowledge and wealth of experience in the field with various NGOs and he continues to support various NGOs and network globally um, and amongst other things he's now uh, supporting and uh, contributing to the Lancet special series on gender norms and health which we're looking forward to um, reading. So um, it's time for questions. So I can see Jacqueline Devine has started us off. And actually, she first has a, or second one, she had a, a comment saying that Pixel 7 was widely assumed to be the reason why the anti-drug campaign failed in the US. Prevalence of pot smoking increased among teenagers exposed. That's interesting. And uh, the question for you, Ben, is that how do your pitfalls and principles differ, if at all, from Bikieri's work? Yeah, thank you. So, so I guess that's that's a very good question, and I try to answer it without becoming too technical. Um, I guess the way I understand. So, so first of all, these these pitfalls are not a, a, a theoretical system; they're more rather practical implications for designing social norms interventions. While Bicchieri has, um, and my theoretical work is, is presented elsewhere, and Bicchieri's work is, um, is, a, um, is, a core, is a theoretical corpus that, I, um, that, wouldn't be, that I wouldn't be able to summarize now in a few, in a few sentences. But I guess one, um, one potential divergence or point of um, disagreement that you might find or, here, uh, when you compare this theory with uh, Bikieri, is that she she believes that for a social norm to be there, you need both of these beliefs. Otherwise, that's not a social norm. So, in other words, uh, in her language, you need both empirical expectation and normative expectations. Actually, these are probably two points. So that's the first one. Um, while I suggest that NGOs should play with these two beliefs independently. Um, partly, because I, um, partly because I believe that the second, the type two belief can have an independent life. So that there are things that I might, so if you take for instance, suicide bombing, I might not believe that many people do it. I might believe that nobody does it, but I might believe that I would be extremely approved for it. And that feeling of approved might contribute to my decision of of, um, of doing that. So that's, that's I guess, the, the first point. And then the second point is probably that because of that, um, 
because of that very restrictive and, and restrictive not in a negative term, but the theory kind of is divided in restrictive approaches to norms and non-restrictive approaches to norms. So be carry falling in the former in the restrictive approach to norm that the norm is there only if both empirical and normative expectations um, exist. I suspect that that these these um, understanding of norms as um, being in a system and in a new universe will find less space in her theory. But, 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 she, but this, is, this, is really, um, this is really a first and very, very shallow response without having to enter into the deep intricacies of the theory, but thank you. Great, thanks, thanks Ben. Um, there are several questions coming in. So, uh, Julianne White, do you think we've underemphasized the logistical, pragmatic constraints on behavior change? For example, um, for example, the example you gave on food vouchers and people getting comfort food, this is largely because of hunger and food security. You want to buy food that fills you up because of historic uncertainty of the next meal. So do you think we've underemphasized the pragmatic? I think that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think there's a very, I think it's a, in a way it's really, I, I, I agree that to a certain extent we can get stuck into explanatory causes, into looking at one explanatory causes, and and instead we should, and this is partly because of the siloed nature of international development, um, in which we get funding from to work on one specific health outcome too. So just to give you a counter, uh, or better, or an, an argument that is aligned with the one that you have there. Uh, one of my colleagues told me that um, they were working on a uh, um, parenting uh, intervention and the goal of this intervention was to increase children's capacity to engage proactively with toys and books um, and after five, but, but, but they were doing this in a context of food scarcity and after five years of trying to change intervention they just said look probably these children are too hungry full stop. And they don't want to think about playing with toys or, or reading books, nor their parents want to because I, so, so in a way, they, the explanation wasn't normative, it was an attitude, you know, it was very material and it was that these children were too tired and, and, and lacked uh, energy. So, so yes, uh, I, think, I think that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Okay, so Peter Pollock, he, Pollock is going back to Pitfall 7. So how do we raise awareness, for example, by publishing data on uh, GBC prevalent, prevalent without running into the risk of promoting gender-based violence amongst those who, as Ben said, are on the edge? Thank you, Peter. Yes, that's a good question. So I think, I think these data and, and this information is perfectly fine for advocacy and lobbying purposes. Um, but I think uh, where I where, my, where I cast my doubts is when when this kind of strategies become a um, a population 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 level intervention becomes a strategy for a population level intervention. So in a way, I don't find I wouldn't find it too worrying if we showed statistics within uh, reports for policymakers or. A research article. I would actually think that's probably a duty that we have as researchers. Uh, but I don't think that I would use posters uh, like these, for instance, in um, uh, in a context where uh, those rapes are taking place in a population among a population of vulnerable or potential victims or potential perpetrators. Ben, can I ask you, can you also um, <clears throat> not make use of this kind of an, uh, information if it's going down, for example, if things are on decline to advertise that so that more people are likely to follow um, a trend towards less harmful, well, less harmful practices or, or, or um, leaving, abandoning harmful practices? 
Yes, actually, there is evidence that focusing focusing on the positive. Uh, that, that's actually thank you all for asking that, Martin. It's an excellent question too. So they, um, there is evidence that focusing on the positive practice rather than on the negative can achieve, and on the and on the values. And again, uh, if I can take an example from uh, Robert Unger's work and Val Curtis, when they did, uh, I think Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, but when they did. Um, a campaign to promote hand washing in, and I think it was in Ghana. Um, not only they had a, small, a very effective and interesting, and to me one of the best things that we have out there in terms of media uh, use of, um, of of social norms, promotion of positive social norms. So not only they had a, a video in which the person who didn't wash their hands was ostr was left alone, but the video also, and then and but the video showed also the positive side. And then everyone was happy with the person who washed his hands. And then, above all, the video ended up saying, respect people, wash your hands. So, so the, I guess what I see in Robert's work here that, that is worth really emphasizing is, is the desire to focus on the positive value and on the spread of the positive practice. Similarly, work that has been done on uh, female genital cutting using social norm theory hasn't focused on saying, cutting your daughter is, is terrible and, and everyone is doing it, but rather promoting family union cohesion, fam, um, body integrity, um, or in certain, in certain cases, keeping the body as God wanted it uh, for the girl. Um, so yes, and then, and then the other piece of, piece of information that is very interesting that emerged this year is that uh, there, is, there is increasing evidence, or well, there is emerging evidence that uh, um, publicizing a minority norm in a way in which, that in a way, so for instance, say that 20% of people are, I don't know, are, are mm, driving carefully uh, without texting. So, so of course, if you say 80% of people text and drive, that's negative. So 20% of people are not doing it. It, it might seem small. But what, so, so what moderates that effect is, is uh, when the norm is increasing, when the minority norm is increasing. So, so in a way, if you show evidence that in 2010, only 2% of people were uh, uh, careful drivers, and in 2020, this has increased to 30%, that not only focuses on the positive norm, but also is a smart way of leveraging a minority norm in a way that might contribute to achieving <clears throat> a positive change. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Ben. And and Robert sort of added to that, who and he thanked you for the fascinating presentation, but also asking, um, it's of, of remarking that it's difficult, to, it's hard to keep all these errors in mind. Can we reverse this perspective from what we do wrong to talk about best practice in investigating, manipulating social norms in a simple way? So uh, then per tech has quite a big question. What, what are the most effective interventions for social norms change? Um, not sure whether you can answer yeah. that, Ben. Well, I can go very quickly and tell you. So, so first of all, I think, Robert, you're right. And I, um, so this, the, the paper we have written is really about the pitfalls and the learnings. And, and I think that focusing on the practices and the best practices is really effective and interesting. And, um, and then to, to respond to a part of question, a recent review by Tank, I think it was Tankard and Pollock, or was Mila Prentice. There are two reviews on, on effective behavioral changes, strategies that use social norms theory, but essentially, I, I can find it if you, if you email me and tell you which one is it. But they found three, they grouped evidence into three types of social norms interventions. The first one is social norms marketing. The second one is personalized normative feedback. The third one is what they call focus group discussions, but I would rather call them um, community conversations. So, so social norms marketing are um, efforts that are for, that include, for instance, publicizing the wide prevalence of a positive norm, correcting misperceptions. Um, an example is 80% of students in the US uh, only drink one beer on Saturday night. Uh, now I'm, I'm making it very simple and simpli uh, uh, simplifying it for the sake of, of time. But then the second type, personalized normative feedback, is um, 
is the kind of approaches that were used to reduce energy consumption. And an example is um, is, the, is a letter that was sent to uh, customers every month, and this letter said, you have used X amount of kilowatts, and this is how you compare to your neighbors. Now, this was very effective in um, reducing those who were at the, at the top, right? So, so those who were consuming much more, uh, seeing that they were consuming much more, that they went to the center. But the problem with this strategy is that those who were consuming much less also moved to the center thinking, oh, fantastic. Uh, if the descriptive norms says that people are consuming more, I can allow myself to consume more. The way they moderated this is by putting smiley faces. So giving an injunctive feedback to. Uh, so a smiley face when you were consuming, when you were the, the best consumer, um, moderated the effect of, of, um, of the descriptive norm that everyone else is consuming more. And then the third type is community conversations, which is uh, frequently used, um, uh, which has been frequently used, for instance, in, on the work on female genital cutting and child marriage. And it really is helping people, it's, it's a long-term strategy of helping people themselves identify uh, the harmful nature of certain norms that are in place. And, and I can tell you more, but, but th there is a nice book that we've written. It's called um, um, Values, Deliberation, and Collective Action in Rural Senegal uh, that details that. Or, or if you send me an email, I can send you probably one or two articles on this third uh, approach. OK. And then there was still uh, a comment from Usha on Pitfall 7, but I'm going to skip that because we've covered that one quite well. And then Fabio Verani asks, are the three norms you presented on uh, gender-based violence the only ones that you found indirectly related to GBC? Are there others that may be indirectly related? For example, I would think that men being expected to be in control of a relationship or household as being a key assumption or norm that drives GBC, also because controlling behaviors are tied to yeah, and, and by the way, there is also a, a, a request by the, the participants whose name is Tom Tom to, to get yeah. a list of uh, helpful readers, and I think we can do that, right, Martin? I think we can. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. And to Fabio's question, I think uh, these, these were more, um, these, example were meant, these examples were meant to um, uh, to, to make a case, uh, we did find these three, but uh, you're right. They're not the only ones that we found populating the, um, the universe of norms that can sustain uh, intimate part of violence. Um, your example is a good one. And, and, and I think it actually helps me mention something that I quite might not have mentioned. And that is that work on norms help break the dichotomy between perpetrators and victims in the case of intimate partner violence. Mm, so in a way, what we had found in India is that uh, mother-in-laws, the, 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 the husbands' mothers, were exercising the type of exercising the type of pressure that you exactly the type of pressure that you're referring to. <laughs> so telling their thoughts, your wife is, is disrespecting you. Are you not a real man? Uh, you should you should make sure that your wife does respect you. So in a way, look at the, the work on norm helps focus on the entire network. Uh, social network that surround the people at the center of the harmful practice and how they are all in a way contributing to sustain it. So thank you for the good question. Great. Um, and then, Kotek, um, again, right, I have another quite broad question. Apologies. What are your reflections on the intersections of social norms and religion? how religion can shape social norms and perhaps encourage social change. Do you have any experience uh, about this? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, uh, uh, in a way, a distinction is often made is between legal norms, moral norms, and social norms. And I'm not quite sure where I stand on this, but, but definitely, uh, I think different types of norms influence each other. So, so if you ju so just touch very briefly upon legal norms, um, Jerry Mackey has written an interesting book chapter on this, and, and the book chapter is called um, Legal Obedience Requires a, sorry, uh, Respect of the Law Requires the Norms of Legal Obedience, which essentially means people respect the law only if they think that everyone else will 
And if they think and and and, uh, and if they think that, that others will accept them and approve of them doing so, and there is also some work by Case Kaiser on the spread of disorder, which essentially suggests that nor there is a spillover effect on norms. Uh, and I can give you some like some content on that. Going back to religion specifically, I think absolutely, um, in a way, what you're referring to is the link between. Uh, rules and interpretation of the rules and the interpretation of the rules is is, is affected by uh, social norms so if you take um, religious rules in in uh, uh, christianity and islam uh, even though they are the same across context interpretation or deviance more easily uh, is permitted in different ways i lived in senegal and uh, I could drink a beer in, in, in uh, Senegal, uh, Senegal is a 95% Muslim country. I could drink a beer uh, in a cafe at 7 p.m. without anything happening to me. Uh, I'm not so sure the same will happen in other contexts. Even though uh, Senegalese people are very um, religious, and, and uh, it, it's just that deviance is tolerated, both for me as a, as a white, as a non Senegalese, obviously non Senegalese looking person. But also for uh, for Senegalese people too. So in the same way, in Senegal you will see women not covering their heads and women covering their heads. So I guess that that's one. That's, and you can look at the work by Michelle Gelfand, and in uh, her work on cultural tightness and looseness, which essentially is a ecological understanding of what affects uh, likelihood of punishment for deviant for people who deviate from the norm. Okay, Ben, thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end of our webinar here, and uh, I was saving Tom's uh, comments <laughs> to last because he thanks you for a clear, informative webinar as well. Um, and uh, Tom also asks, have you, do you have recommended follow-up readings on social norms theory, common assumptions, and practical implications? If a few recommendations can be sent to participants by email, that would be very helpful, and any readings that evaluate publicity campaigns uh, effectiveness on changing harmful norms would be very useful. So um, in terms of resources of the Learning Lab, this, this um, recording will be made available on the STRIKE website, as are all the previous Learning Lab presentations, along with a series of material addressing uh, the issues on, on structural drivers, and so specific things you know, um, most of your papers are um, available free to download, aren't they? Yeah. So thank you very much for an engaging hour uh, talking about social norms. Thank you. Thank you, Martina, right. and thank you, everyone. Yeah.